When these orisons, the comfort of fond and doting age, were in the vernacular of the tongues, they were almost always couched in rhythm, if not in verse, muttered or sung by the crone, and spelt by lisping childhood. The following, perhaps, in the language of the 13th century, was used to staunch blood. Long as be night he understood, to Christ's side his spear he set it, uh, come out water and blood. In the nom de va vada a spun blood. In the nom of the holy ghost asta blood. At Christes will be dreadful the, the no the more. A happy and lucky day was secured in France by a rhythmical invocation, which we notice on account of its relation to another article of popular belief in the con in that country. Namely, that whoever saw the image of St. Christopher was preserved during that day from misfortune. St. Jean et son angel, St. Christophe, St. Christophe et son father, Seante Marie et Sabrasse, Medoint Bon et Eru's journey. No sanction has been given by the Church of Rome to these superstitious observations, which, on the contrary, were severely and sincerely reprobated by their, her prelates. But the corruptions of which Rome proved could not fail to induce others which she condemned. And the boundary between legitimate hag hagiolatry and forbidden saint worship was so faint that such censures would possess but little real influence amongst the uniform, uninformed and illiterate vulgar. The feasts of the saints became associated with many magical observances, obviously derived from the times of heathenism. Both among the Eastern and the Western nations, the Eve of St. John, on whose morrow the sun completed his highest course, was deemed the fitting time for those mystic rites, rites which command the evil spirits and give an insight into fut futurity. In after times, the pure and splendid Artemis herself could no longer be addressed by the maiden of France or England. It was therefore necessary that the invocation should take another form, and the moon was charmed. At that hour, when the silver beams of the newborn Crescent first sh shone forth by the name of St. Lucia, Lucia or St. Agnes. Love charms were sometimes dispensed by bell dames of no ambiguous character. Filters, in most cases, were evidently poisons, and the persons who dispensed them, though innocent of sorcery, were not un undeserving of the punishment of the law. Sympathetic magic compelled the desired object to appear, unwilling perhaps, and unconscious of the power which attracted him. One of the most amusing episodes in the most amusing of romances is found upon this belief. Pamphilia, Pamphila, ignorant of the deception practiced by her attendant, burns the tresses which she supposes to have belonged the, to the Boetian youth. The three wine sacks, whence the hair was cut, became filled with fleeing and with life. They rise and they obey the irresistible spells of the Thessalian sorceress, and stumble with blind alacrity through the street until they arrive at her door. Here, Opelius meets them, and mistaking the goatskins thus animated, for as many midnight robbers, he attacks them with all the valour of the Knight of La Mancha until his sword has laid them low. It is rather sorrowful than amusing to find that another version of this old story was produced as a charge against the luckless Dr. Fian. Daphnis was also compelled to appear, really and corporally, at the bidding of Hecate. And the magic of Thessaly, transmitted from age to age, yet lurks in the, by the village fireside. The task allotted to the lynx is now performed by the dumb cake. The method of composing it may be found in Mother Bunch. 
Some difficulty, however, must be encountered in making this charm stand firm and good. As rather a painful duty is imposed, imposed upon the three spinsters who blend the ingredients. If they speak one word during twenty-four hours, the spell is broken. In Scotland, the stories which are told respecting its effects have all been fatal by catastrophe. They tell you that the bridegroom, thus conducted by the infernal powers, enters the open door at midnight and, looking earnestly at his intended spouse, eats some weapon on, casts some weapon on the table and then vanishes. A marriage, of course, takes place and the wife must keep the murderous token with fearful care. If she parts with it, his love is lost, and if it is discovered by the husband, and according to the story, he always discovers it, then the magical necessity compels him to plunge it in her breast. A mortal, a mortal, a moral might be fancied to lurk in this idle legend, supposing it to be an, apo an apologue, and it possesses as good a right to be considered as the fables of classical antiquity. An intelligible lesson is conveyed. The bearer is wont to distrust an affection raised by a fraud or guilt, and to consider that no passion can produce a durable happiness unless it, is, it fair, fairly arises from the heart. The wily tregator must take his rank amongst the natural mag magicians. When he played in the hall and cast the balls in the air and pierced his body with the innocuous sword, the guests hide him half with delight and half with horror, nothing doubting that some mirror fiend, if not Zabulon himself, assisted in the sport and deceit. Originally, there is no doubt that the juggler was a real mag magician. In the laws of Edward and Guthrum, the Pizzolin is associated with the witch and the murderer, against whom are denounced the, the pains of banishment or death. Bodim is loud in ex exclaiming against the famous Trois Echelles. He must not be identified with the expert finisher of the law of Quinton Derward who was guilty of the diabolical trick of slipping the rings from off a golden bracelet, which nevertheless remained entire. It is said that Tra, Tra Echelles confessed that he performed this and other feats of a like nature at the court of Charles IX by the help of an evil spirit to whom he had sold himself, and he was con condemned to die. A pardon was granted, but the juggler relapsed and was afterwards executed. There is reason, however, to suppose that like many other sorcerers of the Middle Ages, his punishment would, was not only wholly unmerited, and that though he may have been innocent of magic, he understood too well the art of poisoning. It is not difficult to understand that in a credulous age, the tricks which now amuse the countryman at a fair would assume the most potentious colouring. The stages of similar mystifications may often may be often guessed, and sometimes discovered. The following instance is rather remarkable. When Charles V entered Nuremberg, the celebrated Regiomontanus exhibited the automata which he had constructed. An eagle of wood placed on the gate of the city rose up and flapped its wings, whilst the emperor was passing below, and a fly made of steel walked round a table. All this was is sufficiently credible. A few years afterwards, we find the chroniclers relating that the wooden eagle sprang from the tower and soared in the air, and that the steel fly threw, flew three times round the emperor, and then alighted buzzing on his hand. We here ob uh, obtain an exemplification of the manner in which all matters interesting to the imagination are affected by the imagination. One little circumstance is forgotten, another receives a slight tinge of more decided colouring. The narrator is rather glad to excite amazement, the listener is not displeased to be filled with astonishment. 
and, and, ad and adventures and incidents, neither very strange nor very inexplicable, become imperceptibly and unanswerably invested with the attributes of wonder. Baptiste Porter, Carden, and other writers of that class have given us copious treatises on secrets, but they do not elucidate the process of the old jongleurs. Many of their tricks appear to have been performed by the mere vulgar process of dexterity and confederacy. There are instances, however, in which marvels seem to have been effected by physical science, by those who really and truly claim the honours of magic and wonder-working. Amongst the, pre the pagan Teutons and Scla Scla Sclavonians, steam assisted in causing the vo votary to tremble before the god Puster, who in England, in after times, acquired the homely name of Jack of Hilton. That is to say, a metal idol was constructed on the principle of the Elipal, which puffed and roared tremendously as soon as the fire was lighted beneath it. Many a fiery dragon was evidently a firework. Gunpowder was known to be a, to a chosen few long before it was applied to the art of war. In the treatise De Mirabilbus Mundi, falsely ascribed to Albert the Greek, but which belongs to his era, the mode of making rockets is described, and indeed, the process could scarcely fail to be imparted to some of the merchants and pilgrims who, either directly or indirectly, had intercourse with India, although they, although they might not choose to make a public disclosure of the secret. In the Middle Ages, the philosopher was not ignorant of the power of the uncombined lens. Perhaps the telescope was also known, and refraction and reflection would often call the ghost from the tomb and raise the sheeted dead. That the phantasmagoria was really applied for such purposes, even when knowledge acquired more popularity, is satisfactorily evinced by one of the relations in Richard Bovey's Pandemonium, or the Devil's Cloisters, a work inscribed by the learned author to Dr. Henry Moore, in a dedication which vouches for the ver veracity of all the particulars in this collection. Bovey published his book in 1684, and it appears that about 60 years before, Mr. Edmund Anstey of South Petherton had occasion to return home by night from Woodbury Hill uh, Fair, a mart well known in the West Country. Coming to a place not far from Yeovil, noted by the name of the side of the bank, snorted and trembling very much, so that he could by no means put him on his way, but he still pressed nearer to the bushes. At length, Mr. Anstey heard the hedges crack with a dismal noise, and perceived coming towards him in the road, which is there, is there pretty wide, a large circle of duskish light, about the bigness of a very large wheel and in it he perfectly saw the proportion of a huge bear. As clearly, <coughs> clearly as if it had been by day or light. The italics are not ours, they are Bovey's, and mark his horror. The spectre passed near him, and as it came just over and against the place where he was, the monster looked very gashfully at him, showing a pair of very large flaming eyes. As soon as ever it was gone by, his horse sprung into the road and made homeward with so much haste that he could not possibly rein him in, and had much ado to keep the saddle. The old gentleman, Bobby continues, is lately dead, but there are many of the neighbours of good reputation that have often heard him relate this passage, and upon inquiry can witness the truth of it. Yea, and is, it is also witnesses at about the year 1620, some mischievous English scholar was well acquainted with the construction of the magic lantern, so that the story may be considers, uh, considered as a contribution towards the history of inventions. Some profitable knowledge might possibly be derived from a scientific investigation of the feats even of the juggler. It is not unimportant to the metaphysical inquirer to study to the extent 
of the empire gained by the mind over the muscle and organs, which in ordinary cases are not obedient to the will. It is useful to ascertain how much may be effected by mere sleight of hand and dexterity, and to, to consider the wonderful quickness and suppleness to which the human body can be made to obtain by dint of early practice, of perseverance and of labour. Many of the common tricks which make the vulgar stare are not always clearly comprehensible to the philosopher. Science is founded upon experiment, and the experiment of the, bo the booth may be turned to as good account as if it were performed in the lecture room. We have often wondered that these inquiries have not excited more attention, and that so few endeavours should have been made for the purpose of solving the riddles which are daily proposed to us. Without multiplying examples, it will be sufficient to, to notice the faculty of ventriloquism. This art, trick, cheat, or by whatever other name we may call, choose, choose to call it, is acquired apparently with facility by very illiterate men. The deceptions which arise from it are so perfect as to ba baffle the ear and the understanding. The ob is heard amongst us season after season, and yet there is no one of the learned men of this great city who can give any satisfactory, ex satisfactory explanation of the witchery. The northern necromancy is by no means of a spiritual description. In Scandinavia, they know of no ghosts but vampires. The apparition of a dead man is termed a ginganga, that is to say, a revenant on one who gangs again. In consequence of this idea, the Scandinavian assailed those two unwelcome visitants by charms which are equally terrific by, to the living, by process according to due form of law.